I have a uh, <clears throat> weird relationship with fishing. Um, I like it. I'm not good at it. And no one can really be good at it unless you dedicate yourself to this craft. Um, here's the problem. Uh, I grew up in West Texas. And there's no water out there. It's the desert. <laughs> and I specifically grew up in a city called Lubbock. And what they, they have all these amazing lakes, but they're not lakes. What they are are just uh, man-made holes in the ground where uh, rainwater goes to because it's so flat, there's nowhere for water to go when it rains twice a year. And so they just dig holes in the ground and then they put a park around it and they're like, come to the lake. And that's what it is. So when you go to these lakes and try to fish, it's mm, pathetic. And so yeah, that's, but that's, that's your whole experience of fishing out in West Texas. But my grandfather was in East Texas and we'd go out every summer and visit them. And Texas has got like four different countries within it. And East Texas is amazing. And there's water and rivers and trees and all the things. And why we lived out in West Texas and stayed there, this, I, I ask my parents all the time. I don't understand it, but they're there still. And uh, it's awesome. But we went to East Texas. And um, so we, we'd go to, to my grandfather's lake house. It was amazing. It was, just, um, it was a in my mind, it was kind of like slice of heaven on earth. In reality, it was a shallow piece of property with a single wide on it. That was the lake house was a single wide. And then the boat house was actually bigger than the lake house. And it housed some boats that um, you kind of, you could go out on them, but you might die also. So that's what it was. But, but what he had that was amazing was a pier that you could walk out into almost, it just felt like you were walking out into the middle of the lake. And from this pier, you could fish. And oh my gosh, it was amazing. We would always just like have little bamboo poles. You guys know what I'm talking about? Bamboo poles and you just drop your little thing in there and you'd catch fish at least this big. It was amazing. <laughs> and we were just so lit up and we'd keep them and throw them in this little thing he had made. And, and he'd just to humor us, you know, he'd, he'd clean them. He'd teach us how to clean them and we'd cook them. But, but, one time we were like, we want to do real fishing. And he was like, okay. And so he got like a real rod, like he cast for like real fish. And he kind of showed us how to do it. And then we got out there and just my brother and I for like an hour and a half, just casting, just hoping, casting and hoping and just we just weren't, it wasn't, it wasn't happening for us that day. And so my grandfather was like, listen, guys, it's it. so this is all you do. Well, here's what you do. And he casts it one time. <laughs> Snap. And he's got a bass on the line. And I'm like, fishing is for the, it's the devil. It's the devil. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. I'm, and I, I kind of at that point was like, I, I retire from fishing. It's just, it's not good. And, um, and my heart was broken as a kid. Uh, and, and that is my experience in uh, life in fishing. Uh, it's mostly recreational when we think about fishing. We're about to read a story in the book where fishing's not recreational, it's life. And we're gonna look at these men who are fishermen. And Jesus is going to invite them and call them. Uh, but he's not gonna say, he's gonna say something special powerful to them, but it's not about a recreation. It's actually about their whole lives. And then he's going to say, this is what it means to be the people of God. I want you to look at with me at this scripture, Matthew chapter four, verse 18. Jesus is walking by the sea of Galilee. And he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. So just pause real quick. So this is real fishing. That's not, that's not recreational. This, these guys are the pros, okay? For they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. 
immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Now, uh, before we get to going, just, there are a few questions we get a chance to ask. Number one, have you ever asked this question? If you had a chance to read this, why these guys? Why? Why these guys? This, is, this doesn't feel like the best laid plan. You have the son of God who's ready to turn the world upside down in a completely different way. Why these guys? Uh, these are the, these are, honestly, these are, um, the guys that are like, oh, those guys. Like the, this is the West Texas guys. <laughs> like, oh, kind of redneckish, basically. They were guys from the Galilee. This is uh, like roughneck. These are guys that are just like hard workers, just trying to eke out a living. None of them have studied the rabbis. They're not from Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem is the center place. This is where study and arts and entertainment and philosophy and all these things are happening all the time. And this is the epicenter of what it means to be a people who follow God at the temple. None of them are from this area at all. They're not studied in Greek, or Roman philosophy in any way, shape, or form. They don't really understand the world. What they understand is the Galilee, this little area where they fish to try to support their families. That's who they are. And you read these accounts through the Gospels, and what you effectively find all through these stories are just four guys who are incredibly clumsy and forgetful and super hard-headed and they have tons of pride and they have tons of insecurities and they're constantly like trying to jockey for position and their place in this group that Jesus is calling together and they don't have a ton of compassion once they get to come be on the team with Jesus. Then they like puff their chests out and they're like not very compassionate towards anyone or very few people. And even when Jesus is like going through his hardest moment, he's like, guys, would you just pray for me? They fall asleep. It's just not a great group of guys. They just, just, they're just a mess. They're just honestly, just like us. Just like us. Just they are. It's just us. And this is just what God does. As he just uses the unexpected and the unlikely. And he does it from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And he just wants to do something with the people that are going to be his followers. And he wants to bring them into a brand new identity for their lives. And he wants to invite them to start thinking differently about what their plan and what their purpose is for the whole scope of their life. Because he says, you guys are fishing. This is your job. And I want you to put your nets down and I want you to become fishers of men, mankind. So the question is, well, what does it mean to be a fisher of men? What does that mean? What's he asking? He's, a, he's actually saying, I, I want to begin to give you a brand new purpose. This is actually a statement about purpose. About what your life is actually about. You got like one hour. You got one hour here on this earth. And what Jesus just wants to do is say, you have a greater and grander purpose than just getting through and create, having a career and doing the family thing and kind of letting that quote unquote circle of life go by and missing 
the reason that you are here for this hour. It's a statement about purpose. These dudes are not doing East Texas fishing off a pier. This is their whole livelihood. When, when Jesus prays that, you know, teaches them to pray, says, give us this day our daily bread. These guys know exactly what that means. Like we're just hoping for the catch in order to be able to care for our family. That's the literal prayer. And they're immediately giving up what gives them the best chance to care for their families and, to, and have a decent daily existence to do what? To be called into a different purpose to fish for men. And the question is why? Why did they just immediately give this up? And you and I actually already know the answer because you and I feel the pull ourselves because every one of us deep down wants to matter to just have an opportunity to go from existing to mattering to go from being a backwoods knucklehead trying to make it for a chance to be a part of seeing the world changed. Crazy. And this is the invitation for every one of us right now. It's the invitation. It's to go from past existing to having an opportunity to matter. I love the quote from Mark Twain. It says, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. That's profound. There's nothing more important than for every person in this room, myself included, to get rooted deep down exactly why you're here. Because it's bigger than careers and it is bigger than marriage, and it is bigger than children. It's bigger than the greatest institutions that we could have, that we do have in this life. In fact, I'll just say it this way. All of those institutions like careers and marriage and children, they're actually all pointing us to a greater purpose. And part of that is beginning to be invited into the design of God on our lives to matter, to actually have purpose that is so far beyond anything we could accomplish on our own. I think everybody, I don't know that anyone, you could be in here, you don't believe in God at all. I don't know that I know anyone who doesn't want to be a part of something so much bigger and greater than themselves. Everybody wants that. And so Jesus says, well, this is what it means. I'm going to invite you, and I would say he invites us to go along with him to be fishers of men. We fish, we're the, we are the church, we're the followers of Jesus, and we fish for mankind. It's what we do. It's part of who we are. And I love our jobs and marriages and children, all these amazing things. I love it all. But in and with those are meant even greater purpose to fish. Why is that good news? That's good news. You and I have greater purpose, but why? It is, it, and this truth will resonate in every human because we all want to be found. We want to be found. I want to be found. You want to be found. We want to be seen. Everyone wants to be found. You go back to what Jesus actually means when he says fish for men. What he's saying is I want us to be in the business of helping those who are far and lost be found. I want them to be. I want them. This is the God of the universe. I want them to be found. And everyone wants to be found. 
Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells these back-to-back stories. We call them parables, where he gives us these amazing pictures. And in uh, this moment of teaching and telling these stories, Jesus says, here's a story about a son who says, Dad, I'm done with your ways. I'm done living in this house. I'm gonna go do my own thing. I just want you to give me what's mine. I want my inheritance because I'm done living your way and I'm done living in your house. I wanna go and do my own thing. And the father, I don't know, I'm just, if I'm the dad, I'm like, uh, the heck you are. <laughs> but that's just, just me. It's a good thing I'm not God. <clears throat> this God, this father says, okay, I'm going to give you, you're my son. So I'm going to give you your inheritance. He takes his inheritance and he lives it up. Mm. <laughs> Does whatever he wants to do. No rules, no regulations, no one telling him where he has to go or what he has to do. No one telling him right or wrong. He just lives. And he does like everyone who's ever lived comes to the end of living for himself and has got nothing to show for it. Nothing. He's at the end of his dollars. He's at the end of his energy. He's at the end of his whole world. And he's in the, I'm going to talk about pigs. He's in it. And he's going, I have nothing left. And the way, the way I'm living now is way worse. Even my, my dad's servants live better. Maybe there's a chance I could come back home and it, at the very least be able to live like one of my dad's servants. I got a shot, so I'll go home. So the son walks back home in shame and guilt. I can't imagine in this story the shame and guilt. In fact, no, I, I actually can't imagine the shame and guilt that we have felt living our own way. And it doesn't work out. And so he just walks back. And the coolest part of this story is the dad sees him off in the distance. (laughs) And the dad runs out to meet him and wraps him up, pulls him in, and says, oh, my gosh. My son has come home. It's time to party. <laughs> he invites him back into relationship. And he says this in verse 22. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this was my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He was lost. He's been found. That's what it means to come into his family. So when Jesus is looking at these four regular old dudes, what he wants to say is, oh my gosh, your life is so much more than career and family and doing this circle of life. There is a grander purpose in in all of the things that we're going to do. And that is to be one who helps people who are lost be found. 
and you help your spouse be found and your children to be found and your coworkers to be found and your boss to be found and your friends to be found and the gas station clerk to be found. And everywhere we go, we have such great purpose. And that's what he's inviting these guys into. Purpose. So he tells, by the way, the next, very next story, the very next parable he teaches. It says, what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and diligently and seek diligently until she finds it? And you know, you know what this feels like when you've lost the remote control. <laughs> I've just done this before. And when she found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So what he's saying is that you and I are actually in the business of setting off parties in heaven. Like such purpose to be fishers of men to say who is lost and who needs home, who's far gone and needs a father, and needs a friend who needs care and covering. And God's saying, that's what I'm calling you to for you to be partnered with me to set off parties in heaven. That's why we're here. That's what we're doing for this hour. If you ever wondered, like on that Wednesday afternoon, and in fact, I was talking with someone this morning, and you could just ever found yourself like, what am I doing? You ever found yourself there? Maybe with your job or family or... You're just like, what am I doing? How did I get here? Well, this is it. This is what we're doing. That's why we are in the lives that we have, why we have the families we have. and That's why we live in the city we live in. You thought you were just escaping chaos and to move here. No, you're here to fish. You're here to fish. And you got a cool job to get to go fish. And you got a spouse to go fish with. And you got kids to go fish for and with. And all these institutions are opportunities to, to do just like these four regular old dudes to change the world. How unbelievable is it to be the church? How unbelievable is it for us to be the church? That's what this is about. I was lost and Jesus came and found me. That's what he did for us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that would whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. In other words, Christianity is, isn't just a good idea, it's a necessity. It is the transference from no purpose and emptiness and brokenness and selfishness and death into the fullness of life and life eternal. What we're doing as the church is bigger than anything we could get our heads around. It matters for eternity. You matter for eternity. Your purpose matters for eternity. So let's like take a breath and go, okay, God, then I wanna get to fishing. I wanna get to it. The default is to perish but you don't have to and they don't have to and no one has to. Jesus' arms are open wide. Come on into the family. You're the one 
who heard about God and ran away for years and years and did your own thing, come home. You're the one who said, I don't believe in God. I don't think that he actually exists. There's no scientific proof. Come home. Being invited by the God of the universe to have more purpose than we could ever possibly imagine. And it's understanding the lostness that we've all had that helps us, by the way, be fishermen. And I cry reading the, these parables and these stories because I'm that and you are too. And I got saved at like six months old. I just, I've been saved a long time. I've been saved a long time. I think I have a godly heritage, a godly family. I'm the prodigal son. We are. We are the lost coin. And God's finding us, found us. So can we just be a part? Could we accept that call to have purpose? Because when you and I get found, we go find. Found, found people, find people. Found people, find people. Once you've been found, you're like, dude, you got to be found too. <laughs> and I, there's so much shame and guilt. Like, uh, you know, if I say the word evangelism, you're like, oh my gosh, pastor, please. Uh, you got to go out and you get people saved. And, and listen to me. There's one person who saves. Yes. You and I won't save anyone. But you and I will testify to the one who has saved us. And that's the call here. It's not to become super robo Christians or you got to stand up here and you got to stand on the street corner and scream at people about how they're going to go to hell or this is not the call. And I'm not, listen, I'm not, and you know, I know there's some really well-meaning street preachers out there. I'm not against that. What I'm talking about is I've been found not you better or you or else. But I've been found. And I, I want you to be found. This is the heart of fishing. And candidly, it's sometimes for you, because you know your story and you know some that you're some of you are fishing for right now. And it's kind of like uh, me fishing off the pier, my granddad's house. I'm casting, and I'm sharing, and I'm loving, and let's have another coffee. And here's one more encouragement for you, and nothing's happening. And hey, good news, that's not your responsibility. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. What do we do? We just keep casting. Like an eight-year-old in East Texas, I'm just trying, and I just want to give up. But the king knows exactly what he's doing, so we just keep casting. So he knows his time. He knows his design. And so that's what we want to do. At the end of our time on this earth, what would bring us more joy or more satisfaction or more sense of having fulfilled our purpose than knowing that God in his grace used me one person at a time, one person at a time to bring people to be found. That's the question, that they get to be found for eternity. So the question is, well, how do, how do we fish then? What does it look like for us to fish? I'm gonna go quickly because we've got, we wanna take communion and just connect with the heart of God here at the end. Um, just have a few very, very simple things. If you're going like, I don't know how to do this. I'm not sure what to do. How do I do it? It's very simple. Number one, could, could we just, just pray? And I say that, I know, by the way, pray is always number one on every list for what do we do next. So we can maybe it's easy to roll your eyes, or even I rolled my eyes as I was writing this down. Because the truth is this, do I actually believe that the Father is in control? And could I just begin to ask, oh, Father, Lord, would you touch that person? Just pray and ask. Praying and asking actually takes the role of responsibility off your shoulders. 
and he gives it back to the Father who's ready to run and meet in his time, his way. And so I honestly don't always carry a great heart to pray. This would be the first one to tell you. I feel like I like all the strategies and all the thoughts. How do we do this? And I can think organizationally, and maybe what could we do together and do this? But the truth is, we just need to pray. I just want to get the Father's heart. That's the first place. We get the Father's heart, it changes the game. Because you can get frustrated or disappointed or hurt. And we just get the Father's heart. When we pray, we get the Father's heart. And then all of a sudden, we have endless amounts of grace to care for people. So we just ask, God, can, would you give me your heart? Give me compassion. Give me your love. And would you change my mind from like obligation, like I have to do this in order to be a good Christian, take it off the obligation thing and bring it into privilege as a son or a daughter of the, the one who found us, adopted us, brought us in and gave us life and purpose. So no more obligation, just privilege to partner with King of the universe. And uh, we have an opportunity to just ask God, would you deepen the joy of my own salvation so that I'm eager to share with others? So these are the ways we can pray. And Lord, I pray and name them. God, touch their life. And then two, we just invite. So invitation is great. Invitation to your home. Our churches often are great about invite to our church. Invite to here. There's a really amazing preacher. You gotta come here. Come. No. Well, yeah, that's two. Yes, that too. Then invite them to church. I do. Invite them here. But how about invite them to coffee? Or just invite them to the ball game that you're going to. Or just because the invitation just says, I like you and I care about you. So we invite people to connect, coffee, cheese, whatever it is. We invite. How about instead of feeling like a salesperson who has to have all the answers, by the way, to close the deal? We actually just get to see ourselves as connectors, inviting people to places where people have a chance to connect with God. Maybe it's your home. Maybe it's here on a Sunday. I, I, I want to invite, just invite someone to the palm party. We're, I, there's an, I, I'm not going to stand up and do a gospel presentation. We're just going to hang out and invite people to come hang out. It's the whole point. It's all it is. Come hang out. We like you. Come hang out. So we invite. We invite. And then we get to care. Is it possible just for us to start thinking about how we could care for those that are in need? I want to care. You guys, come on up. I know, we got to get to the things. Uh, in Jeremiah 29, I won't take the whole time to read the whole text, but it just says, Jesus says, you guys are in exile. God, you're in exile, but what I want you to do is care for the city. I want you to care. Care for those that are in need. And do well for the city. And so we got to be a people who care for our city. In fact, uh, in your chair when you came in, sorry, uh, if you grab, there's a sheet of paper. We just have these ministry partners. These are people that, uh, these are ministries that we are partnered with that we're just going to go, how can we care for our city better? And we're looking for ways. In fact, I'm meeting with our missions team this afternoon. Just talk about, hey, what are ways that we can care for our city? And partner with these guys to love people and see, see Jesus highlighted. I'm grateful for our partners. And then just finally, I would say this. Could, could we just ask for opportunity to just share our story? There it is. If you want to know, like, what's the most effective way to fish? Just God, give me a chance to share my story. You don't have to like force it. You don't have to force it. Just God, would you give me a chance to share my story? All right, you guys stand with me. We're gonna close. 
with an opportunity just to celebrate being found. We're gonna take communion here in a moment. I'm gonna invite you to come. You can come down the center aisle, come receive the elements. As soon as you receive the elements, you can take them. Uh, You can take them there. You can take them back to your seat, however you want to connect with God. But we just wanna take this opportunity to celebrate being found. So God, Jesus, you found us. You found us. You found us and you brought us into your family. You gave us life. We thank you and we receive, Jesus, your body that was broken to make us whole. Jesus, your blood that was shed so that we could be brought into a new covenant and made pure and righteous. You have done for us what we could not do for ourselves. You found us and you changed us and then you gave us more purpose than we could ever possibly create for ourselves. It's eternal. It lasts for forever. Thank you, God. Thank you. Jesus, we recognize your sacrifice is what is purchased for us, purpose for forever. We receive your body and we receive your blood as an anchor for what it means to be in your family. Thank you. You guys are free to come and receive. Our team's gonna worship over us and we'll finish this morning. Come, receive